We have hydrostatic equilibrium that keeps stars stable. Pressure is balanced by gravity. The energy for that pressure is supplied by fusion. If you don't have fusion supplying new energy, you, uh, you have all this radiation coming out, the stuff's going to cool, the pressure's going to go down, gravity's going to win. And when gravity wins, various bad things happen to the star that usually make it blow up in gigantic explosions. And explosions are always entertaining, so we like those. <laughs> a lot of things we study in uh, astronomy are so far away, they never seem to change or do much. Um, you know, you get excited about seeing these little knots over years slowly move out from that Herbic Hero star. But this is something dramatic, these supernovas when they go off. But high mass stars are, are all believed to blow up in supernovas. And uh, they can be the brightest objects in the sky when they happen, if they're close enough. If they're too close, they would probably uh, destroy all life on Earth. Too far away or on the wrong side of the galaxy, you don't see them at all. So we already uh, had yesterday, I think, I uh, showed a picture of Tycho's supernova various uh, supernova remnants at various stages. You were commenting yesterday in the Cold Equation movie how there's not hundreds of supernovas going on every day. Is there any estimates how many are going on in the Milky Way galaxy? There are 400 billion stars. Yeah, I should have looked up that number. Um, it's one a year. I think it's one a year. You think it is one a year? I think so. It is something close to that. Within an order of magnitude, it's one a year. Yes, yeah. yes. But we don't see them because they're not that close. They're okay. hidden by gas and dust. So this is basically, is another way to look at the supernovas that fizzling out of the Milky Way galaxy is these things continue to pop eventually. They'll all be gone. Will all the stars in the Milky Way eventually burn out and it's done? They will not all be supernovas. Only the most massive stars are going to blow up as supernovas. But as, as the stars burn through their fuel, I, what I understand is there's some kind of at the cores, there's some kind of replenishment process where new stars are coming out of the core of the Milky Way, or is it like finite? Like we'll, we'll talk about this uh, in the context of galaxies. There is new active star formation going on in galaxies today, some galaxies and not others. Um, there are some galaxies that have used up all of their gas, they've turned it all into stars, and they're stripped of gas now, and you've just got bunches of old red stars. Uh, the Milky Way has gas and is still forming new stars, and lots of these systems will continue on doing this for billions and billions of years yet to come. Okay. But, uh, you know, there is only a finite amount of stuff. We do think there's primordial gas still falling in, uh, coalescing with existing galaxies. So there is a, a fresh supply out in intergalactic space that's falling in. But, uh, you know, it's all limited at some level. <laughs> They're easier to see in other galaxies because we're not, we're not sitting inside them. Um, when we look at a distant galaxy, we can like, see the whole galaxy and just sit and watch it. Every uh, so often we take a picture. They're supernova searches. They're very organized. They know if they go look at uh, 300 galaxies and they look at them over a certain time period, they're going to find so many supernovas statistically. Yes. So the most recent famous one was in one of the Magellanic Clouds, which is a satellite galaxy of our galaxy. It's, 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 it's usually about one a century historically for bright supernovas we can see from Earth. Uh, we were sort of in a drought before 87A, and it's technically in a nearby dwarf galaxy, irregular galaxy, which is OK. We don't want supernovas going off right next to us all the time. I find it interesting that all the Americans who speak about it, they, well, it's kind of sort of another galaxy. And as a Canadian, I'm always saying, you know, we're actually, we may be small, but we are actually separate, right? You know, it's kind of interesting, because I always think of Magellanic Clouds, they're small, they're little, they're nice, and they are separate galaxies. Well, they're kind of, sort of technically separate, but they're really in our sphere of influence. So. Well, yeah, sure. Naked, na naked, uh, naked eye supernova feels like it's got to be close. Got to be close, got to be close. But an interesting cultural difference. Canada's which state? The yeah, 50, exactly. 51st? <laughs> Yeah, I had no idea. Okay, let's uh, let's jump back a little bit. Uh, we've, we've started talking about supernovas, but we're 
we're jumping ahead of ourselves a little bit. We have these giant stars, we have these main sequence stars. How does that happen? When hydrogen in the core is completely converted into helium, um, we finished our hydrogen burning phase. So fusion is called burning uh, in astrophysics. Now you can still have hydrogen burning going on in a, um, in a shell around the core, the pure helium core. And so you have a helium core, hydrogen burning shell, and this configuration can produce more energy uh, than needed uh, for the pressure support against the gravity. And this uh, winds up causing the outer layers uh, to expand out. And you solve the computer models and you get a stable configuration for this that's quite a bit different. So something like, let's see, this is a, a five solar mass red giant, so it's a little bit bigger, more massive than the sun. This is one solar radius here. And it blows up into something like this, uh, close to 100 solar radii. And we had uh, Betelgeuse close to 1,000. So imagine this a factor of 10 bigger. So you've got down here within a tenth of a solar radius the helium core, and the next tenth here more or less you've got this hydrogen fusion uh, shell. So you burn hydrogen on the main sequence until you run out and you get one of these different internal structures. The star rearranges itself to, to be in equilibrium and this new configuration is this vastly expanded shell. It depends on the mass of the star. So the very massive stars, this happens relatively quickly. Uh, this, was a, this was a limit. I had Pollux, which uh, is expanded into a, a red giant. And I needed that. I needed to have my civilization at the right technological level to do something about that. And then exist long enough through the process so that the process was over by the time humans were on the scene. And this, I, I had to look at uh, the time scale for that particular mass star, and it came out to be, I think, about a million years, if I remember right. And that set the time scale for, for the events of my story. It wasn't that I wanted it to be that long necessarily, but that's how long it had to be. Um, and that can be much more rapid for a high mass star. For a lower mass star, that can be um, millions more years. And one of the uh, links I have on that web page of astronomical online resources is something called star clock and it will let you put in a particular mass star and then show you how it evolves on the HR diagram in discrete time steps. So you can follow it through the main sequence and then off into its giant evolution. And so I needed stellar evolution models to write my hard SF book. That's one of, my, one of my rules, if it's hard SF, if you need a calculator or computer models to write the book. <laughs> okay, so here are the paths on the HR diagram for stars on the main sequence evolving off into giant and supergiant phases. So we have Deneb, we have Betelgeuse, uh, here's Pollux uh, from my novel. Uh, it evolved from a star a few times more massive than the sun. And the sun will evolve into a giant in another four or five billion years, give or take. Yeah, and when I had this version of the slide, um, this keeps going back and forth, whether or not the Earth is going to be uh, inside the, the photosphere of the uh, expanded giant sun in the future. It's a little argumentative point um, the, because there's some other effects that can change the Earth's orbit in that same time scale as the uh, as the uh, sun expands. Assuming it's obvious, obviously fairly irrelevant since we're going to be fried long before the time. Yeah, uh, either either the will be inside the surface of the sun or it will fill almost all the sky and toast everything anyway. I mean, but it's one of those stupid things people argue about, it right? Is, yeah, it seems like it's not It's like, which one's going to kill you first? Uh, <laughs> you freeze to death or run out of air? Oh. It does have implications on our predictions about how other stars are going to behave. And so that's, that's, that's. 
Yeah, it's going to come out real close to the Earth, Earth's uh, orbit. We know that, just how close, uh, it's a little less clear. The issue is how far tidal drag is in the Earth's orbit? Yeah, those, those are the kind of effects that, uh, that have to be taken in consideration. Where approximately will the habitable zone be uh, after the Earth, after the Sun? Uh, we'd have to calculate that out. It wouldn't be too hard. I had to do this in the case of Pollux to know what it looked like. And um, I just scaled it so that the radiative flux was about like that of the Sun. And I think it came out to, in the case of Pollux, that we had to be out like about 10 AU away. Uh, is that right? No, it was, I think it was further. I think it might have been 10 light hours. Uh, I, need to, I need to go back and look at that exactly. So well, well beyond anything else in the solar system. Uh, comparable to the outer parts of the solar system. How far out we'd have to calculate that. We could do that uh, later if you're interested. Um, You've got this helium core with no more fusion going on, at least in the right mass range. You, you can't get to temperatures high enough for, for fusion. So there's no thermal pressure to resist the gravitational collapse. And eventually, you're squeezed into a, a degenerate condition. And it's sort of awful that we're going to wind up with the phrase degenerate white dwarfs. It sounds like we're <laughs> being kind of cruel. You know, you know, short people got no reason, but you don't have to call them degenerate. Uh, so what eventually provides the pressure to resist and halt the gravitational collapse is something called uh, electron degeneracy. Um, has to do with, the, somebody made a, oh, Joe's uh, uh, Twilight Zone episode referred to the Pauli exclusion principle. <laughs> The Pauli exclusion principle holds up the, uh, the cores. Um, you squeeze everything together. And in quantum mechanics, we have this rule about how closely together you can put electrons. And you can put them together um, in pairs into various energy states. And uh, once you reach that, they don't want to they get any closer together. And this uh, resistance to further collapse stops gravity from winning. And we call matter in this state degenerate. Um, you've collapsed everything down. You've got everything in the lowest energy states uh, as close together as it'll, nature will allow. And uh, you're OK from gravity anyway. No, um, jumping ahead a little bit, this is a, a white dwarf. Uh, the cores, these kind of degenerate cores later become white dwarfs and they sit there, they don't re-expand, they stay um, about the size of the earth. And what a white dwarf is, the exposed degenerate cores. So once they, they get out there, they get all the stuff away from them, they cool off, they just sit there, they don't uh, grow appreciably. There'll be uh, some stuff on the very outside surface that's not necessarily degenerate, but inside, uh, Gravity is going to hold it there Ignoring at that point. the practical constraints of getting there, if you could go down there, pick up a, a, you know, a handful of it, and carry it away, what would happen to that handful of it? Uh, I think I would have to do the calculation. I know you wouldn't have a chunk of it that could hit the Enterprise. <laughs> a big jagged chunk. Um, maybe we'll, maybe we'll do the calculation tonight after a couple of beers. That's always the best time. Um, you know, what's the gravitational force? Um, you know, how much how much stuff is that, and what's its gravity on various distances? A very small enough piece. You well, I, I think it would, uh, but it would depend on maybe the thermal energy inside it. Uh, certainly when it's part of the big mass, it's got all that other gravity sort of holding it there and, and keeping it down. Um, so the question is, there's some limit when you take away all the assistance from the rest of the, the body, uh, would that spontaneously pop out? So. How small a piece could I carve out? 
So we have to figure out what this pressure is, and we have to balance that against its own self-gravity. And we can do that calculation and, and find out. So that would be interesting to do. And can you ship it via FedEx? <laughs> yeah. um, not from England, apparently. Yeah. That was my question. Yeah. Oh, oh, small piece yeah. It's yeah. Right. Maybe you'd have a, a, a device that, an artificial field that would keep it if that was necessary. Well, in, in stories, I know how to do it. You <laughs> <laughs> have to do it in real life. I want to think about that a little more. The, the larger pieces seem real unrealistic when I've seen them in Star Trek or things. And they've never been round sort of things, they've just been chunks. And I don't think that's realistic, though. And you think they are going to expand or they're going to be round. They're not going to be a big jagged chunk anyway. OK, uh, red giants continue to evolve depending on their mass. And you can get, for massive enough stars, the helium in the core to fuse. Helium can burn into carbon. There's a, something called the triple alpha process that produces some beryllium uh, as a step. Uh, and finally producing uh, carbon-12 along with energy. And uh, when you trigger the helium uh, burning, you have a stage called the helium flash. And there's a parallel main sequence, a helium main sequence, to go with the hydrogen main sequence. And so stars generally spend 90% of their time on the hydrogen main sequence. And if they're capable of burning helium, 10% uh, more sitting on the helium main sequence. OK, so where do we get this information about stellar evolution? How do we test the ideas? How do we quantify it empirically? Well, we have these ideas about star forming regions. Something happened to shock that cloud into gravitational collapse. And so if you see a star cluster, you can assume those stars were all formed at the same time, more or less. And we know these more massive stars evolve more quickly than the less than massive ones. They burn through their fuel much, much faster, even though they start off with more fuel. What does approximately mean in your world? Um, millions of years, maybe tens of millions. Okay. If you remember, the protostar collapse times uh, went up to 100 million years. So even if you collapse the star, you know, the shock wave has to propagate through your, your cloud. It has to set off. These clouds could be 100 light years across. Um, these less massive stars are going to uh, form much more slowly than the more massive ones. I guess I'm thinking about in, in the light of um, multiple stars. If you have enough multiple stars, some of them have planets that are able to support life and basically everybody's starting at the same start point. If it's only a couple of million years, which is nothing compared to the four billion years it's taking life to evolve here. So you could conceivably have uh, life organizing. Like I said, uh, approximately the same time, 100 million years. Life did not take four billion years. It took a few hundred million years. The four billion is for the Cambrian explosion to have a lot of multicellular life. Because that really puts a pickle in a lot of, a lot of fiction. Unless all your worlds are full of humans. Well, this, this again, Stan Schmidt says, you know, don't use these name stars because the name stars are the luminous ones or the evolved ones. So either you've destroyed your life by, by this evolution or you've uh, not had enough time uh, to get it developed. So you have to, at least if you're aware of this, you know, they're interesting stories to tell. But, you know, just saying, here's my alien civilization, I'm going to pick a B star because I know. Um, Rigel or one of these things, it's, a, it's an A star or B star. I'll just pick that because that's a, I like that name and mm -hmm. off you go. And yes. Anyway, what you do is you make an HR diagram with all the stars in your star cluster. So they're all the same age. And what you get is something like this. All your low mass stars are sitting on the uh, main sequence. At some point, you run out of stars in the main sequence. All the ones more massive, more luminous, have already evolved. They don't exist there anymore. They're gone. Remember, it only took about a million years to get things on over here, and they burned through their fuel in like a million years. So a million years, and these O stars are gone. Supernova? 
supernova. And your B stars too, maybe 10 million years. So you lose all this stuff and there's some turnoff point where basically the, the age, uh, the main sequence lifetime of a star at this turnoff point tells you the age of that star cluster. These are the ones just running out of hydrogen fuel that are going to evolve into giant stars. And usually there's a, a limit here. You can't see all the red dwarfs because your telescope's not powerful enough, you didn't look at it long enough, what have you. So this is sort of a theoretical one. Whoops. Okay, so this is arranged in order of age, youngest star clusters at the top, older star clusters down here. Um, this is like a, mil a star cluster at an age of about a million years. The uh, low mass stars haven't gotten onto the main sequence yet. And the highest mass stars are just starting to become giant stars. 10 million years. You start peeling off the highest mass stars, the B stars up here, they have a supergiant. M stars down here still haven't gotten to the main sequence. 10 to the 8 years, 100 million years. You've gotten rid of all those high mass stars. Your M stars are all now happily burning hydrogen on the main sequence. And you've got a handful of giants over here. Billion years. You just keep peeling off deeper and deeper into the main sequence. You get to 10 billion years and you get something that shows uh, some giant evolution and your M stars are still sitting down there burning hydrogen. So we can look at HR diagrams of real star clusters that resemble these sort of idealized situations. So these are now real star clusters, NGC 2264, more or less a million years old. Here's a picture of it. it. Looks like a young H2 region, star forming region. Pleiades, it's an open star cluster, starting to fall apart, but it's about 100 million years old. You can do an HR diagram the Pleiades. This is something a uh, college astronomy major might do for a, for a lab exercise. Uh, an advanced lab, but taking the telescopes out, uh, measuring uh, brightnesses and colors and putting on an HR diagram. And that's what the Pleiades look like. Are those nebulae then caused by the gas from the supernovas of the stars that are already gone? Uh, maybe, whatever remnants of the stellar cloud or uh, supernova debris or things uh, to scatter that light. Messier 67, older star cluster, about uh, 4 billion years old. Looks like that. It's an old open cluster. Okay, red dwarfs. They're completely convective. They have a lot of fuel because they don't just have a hydrogen core. As soon as they start turning hydrogen into helium, they start bringing in more hydrogen from uh, surface levels. So they keep these things completely mixed and they're gonna burn all their hydrogen. So it's another reason they uh, last so long. It depends. Um, there are, we see both, this is a convective zone here and this is a radiative zone. So it's different in the different mass stars. And you solve the computer models, whatever's most efficient is what the star is going to do. But you have to take into account convective uh, and radiative transport uh, to, to solve these. Okay. Um, in particular, because of this convection issue in these M stars, they're never going to turn into giant stars. They're never going to have this sort of shell burning. 
in the same way that more massive stars do. Okay, sun-like stars. Sun will develop a helium core. It will expand to a red giant with a uh, hydrogen shell burning phase and have some ignition of helium in the core and will eventually turn the helium into carbon and oxygen. Before it expands, it, it won't ignite the helium. It runs through the hydrogen and has helium. There's not enough pressure. The, the expansion happens during the shell burning phase. The helium ignition happens in the giant phase. What prevents the helium burning from starting earlier? Uh, the conditions in the core are not hot and dense enough to drive those fusion reactions. That's something that happens in the giant phase. Okay, so these degenerate cores are what become the white dwarfs. We saw the white dwarfs in the HR diagram. These are uh, what's left over when these lower mass solar type mass stars eventually get rid of their, uh, their outer shells, their outer envelopes. So the mass of white dwarfs, they're like solar mass. They're stars like the sun. When they're first exposed, these cores are hot, maybe 25,000 degrees Kelvin. That's why they're blue. We call them white because they sort of look white. Uh, they have a lot of light from all the colors of the spectrum. Luminosity is only 1% solar. They're small, Earth-type sizes. So, uh, so Ed, we'll have to take maybe a beach ball size, look up the mass of a ocean liner and calculate gravity and let's see one teaspoon is 16 tons how, how are you going to pick it up off the surface again oh, that's just engineering <laughs> <laughs> Lever. fair enough so again here's the white dwarfs what happens is there's a phase that we're going to see planetary nebula phase where Stars like the sun blow off their outer envelopes, exposing these degenerate cores, which uh, become the white dwarfs down here. And then they just exist passively cooling for billions and billions of years, just getting cooler and fainter. Okay, so you probably heard of the uh, Chandrasekhar limit. And basically, uh, Chandrasekhar worked out using a little bit of relativity what was the maximum degenerate mass that you could have um, before even that would collapse. So I, I don't want to go into the details of this. I'm a little pressed for time. But it's this famous sort of 1.4, it's 4.1 or 4.4. Anyway, it's about 1.4 solar masses. And at this point, um, you get a runaway collapse. Uh, this degenerate pressure won't hold it together. The gravity is so strong, it's going to pull those electrons in even closer, and you're undergoing a, a phase change. Uh, you can't, the electrons won't do that. They can't stay electrons. You uh, wind up making neutrons, combining the electrons and the protons. This is where we're going to get neutron stars from, but more importantly, uh, you get uh, supernovas also. OK. Um, so we'll talk about that momentarily. But some of these really beautiful nebulas that you see, they look like little planetary nebulas. They looked like little disks through telescopes. So <coughs> the planets looked like little disks. These nebulas look like little disks. So they call them planetary nebula. I always give a multiple choice question on my exams for undergraduates. A planetary nebula is A, B, C. One of the choices is a, a type of planet. I don't know why they circle that, because if they come to class or read the book, well, this is the answer. They don't come to class or they don't read the book. <laughs> I, I know the answer. But I always put on a few dead easy questions like that just to reward the people who at least came to class and read the book. So is that on our final test? <laughs> I don't know. I don't remember. <laughs> if you're awake, uh, you're, you're going to get it right. But these envelopes blow out uh, you know, way beyond the, the range of any solar system. You can see them uh, 
uh, for, uh, for light years. And you see the exposed white dwarfs in the middle of these things. And they're hot, they have ionizing radiation, black body radiation. They ionize these shells and they can be quite beautiful. And they're generally pretty young. These expansions, uh, they expand out uh, 10, 20 kilometers per second. Earth moves around the sun about 30 kilometers per second. So it's sort of a planetary orbit kind of velocity. Nothing to do with planets. So Ring Nebula and Lyra. This is a favorite target for amateur astronomers. It's pretty nice to look at. No, those, those kind of velocities um, going straight out like that, they're going to disperse out. Uh, OK, let me skip that detail. So we got some pretty pictures of some planetary nebula. When you get these things in binary stars, they're particularly interesting. Stellar magnetic fields might also have an effect on how this stuff is blown out. Maybe we'll get the second light here. Thanks, Nora. That's better. So a lot of these are nice targets for small telescopes. Joe, do you have a favorite? I like both the Eskimo and the Ghost of Jupiter. I like the Eskimo. It's also called the Owl, right? Yeah. I like well, that one. Is, looks like the the oh. the first major the has a <laughs> Joe knows. And here's a gallery from the Hubble Space Telescope of some planetary nebulas. They're quite striking. OK, I mentioned, I think, to Julie here, some funny things can happen with stellar evolution in binary stars. Um, I don't want to talk about Lagrangian points. I'll let Joe do that a uh, little bit. But uh, we have these things called Roche lobes or Roche surfaces. It's just a mathematical calculation to see um, where the gravitational influence of one star versus the other dominates. Uh, and it's important sometimes in understanding uh, Stellar evolution in binary systems. Lagrangian points are points of gravitational stability. I won't talk about them. But you can get some wacky things in binary star systems. So we've got two stars here, a massive star, star B, less massive star, star A, center of mass is here close to the massive star. Massive star evolves faster, right? Burns through all of its hydrogen. Shell burning, giant phase, and then it's this giant phase. It'll it'll have this teardrop shape, and across the inner Lagrangian point, star A can accrete gas from star B, and as gas moves from here to here, star A becomes more massive, star B becomes less massive. The Roche lobes change, and this process is stopped um, when uh, when, when you've had enough mass transfer that, that you separate the stars again, you don't have the Roche lobes being filled. And then star A can evolve into a giant, fill its Roche lobe, and send mass back to star B. There are a lot of different possibilities for this in these close binary systems. You have contact bi binaries where the stars are actually in contact as they evolve. The stars can merge. One star can eat the other. Or they can do this kind of dance back and forth where the mass sloshes back and forth in some complicated way, screwing up all these models that I've just shown you and all these things I've just talked about. It's no problem when they're separate, but when they're close, they can do some strange things. And there are a class of uh, objects, things called like uh, blue stragglers, where you look at your H diagram of the cluster, you see your turnoff point in the main sequence, 
and then you see one or two stars sitting up there in the main sequence in a place they shouldn't be. It's because it's maybe a merged binary, it's evolved in some different, uh, different way. So I think this is cool. I always wanted to write a uh, story since I was in grad school, I think. I never did. I just wanted to use the, the metaphor of binary star evolution where one star consumes the other. It can happen in a period of months uh, for a, a bad relationship. <laughs> I thought it'd be a good Connie Willis style story, but uh, Connie's husband got his PhD from our department, by the way, and uh, they lived here for many years, and they're just an uh, hour and a half away from here in Greeley. It's not More or less. So you can wind up with white dwarfs in binary systems. Uh, this is uh, my first novel, Star Dragon, had this kind of, uh, this kind of system. Main sequence star, white dwarf, with mass being pulled off the uh, main sequence star, forming a disk accreting onto the white dwarf. So I, uh, I had star dragons, alien creatures that lived in the accretion disk here. And I thought it was a cool idea in a different environment. I didn't want to do, oh, I'm going to have an alien planet around a different star and tell you what that's like. I'm like, screw that. That's not weird enough. Uh, let's tell you what this, uh, this environment's like. Okay, let me move on. I'm, I'm just pressed for time here, so I want to... Now, we talked about supernovas just a little bit, and we'll talk about them a little bit more. Um, but white dwarfs can explode as supernovas or novas um, if they're in binary systems. And the thing is, normally an isolated white dwarf will just cool off over time and not do anything. It'll just float down the main, it'll float down the HR diagram. However, if you can get a white dwarf to accumulate more mass than Chandrasekhar's limit, it can explode as a supernova. Or, if you want a nova rather than a supernova, you get uh, accretion of gas onto the surface, and you get a very hot, dense layer of, of hydrogen sitting on the surface that can be ignited basically in a second so it's got hydrogen fusion going on all over the surface. It's like the core of a star suddenly exploding all over the surface of the uh, white dwarf. And so this is not as energetic or luminous as a supernova, but these novas uh, happen in the universe and we can study them and they're very interesting in their own right. So did that one appear in 1975 or yes. is that a serial number? No, this is, refers to the year. And there are systems of recurrent novae. Every few decades, they explode as nova because there is a binary star system. Uh, that star, uh, that fusion ignites in the surface, blows up as a nova. The, the white dwarf is still there. It's just the surface fusion that happened. A very dramatic event, but uh, doesn't destroy the star. But then it begins to accumulate more gas from its partner star onto the surface. And a few decades, it, blows up as a nova again. Do we see any of those? Or yes. What's their cycle? Uh, the ones I'm aware of are decades. How do they affect the, the, the other star in the binary? Um, not as much as you might think. Um, they do heat up the close side uh, compared to the far side. Um, it doesn't substantially change the evolution that much, except through the, the mass transfer is more important. Okay, so we already talked about this in the case of the sun. Sun's going to expand to a Janet, to a giant, more or less, at one AU. One way or the other, the Earth is toast. Um, we're not completely certain if the sun's going to form a planetary nebula. Probably. And there'll be a, a carbon-oxygen core of the sun that will uh, eventually be a, a white dwarf that alien astronomers can observe, or our own descendants if we're that lucky. Uh, 